<clears throat> Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Engineering Entrepreneur Podcast, episode 145. This is your host, Scott Tarsi, and I run caddesignhelp.com. Before we get started, sign up my email list, caddesignhelp.com. Once you sign up, I'll send you a free PDF of the top four mistakes inventors make. I have a new online course on how to become an engineering entrepreneur. It's on the website. Please leave me a review on iTunes or Podbean or any other app you use. Send me an email for any feedback. My email is info at caddesignhelp.com. Our guest this week is Francis Lacoste. He is an engineering leadership coach who runs, who helps CTOs and VPs of engineering at scaling tech startups, nurture amazing work cultures, and high-performance teams that build products and services that delight their customers. Francis, thanks for coming on. Please give us a, a background, and then we can talk more about your work experience. Thank you, Scott. Um, yeah, um, my background. So, I, like you said, I'm an executive coach, uh, working mainly with CTOs and VP of engineering at uh, scaling startups. Usually, when they need to, um, working mainly with technical founders, and then like they, they have a small team, and then they need to, they got their Series A or some are, are hiring rapidly and need to scale their team and now they have to, to make a choice. You know, are they be going to become like an organization leader or want to remain in a technical role? And for those who want to make that transition, instead of just building the product, building also the organization that built the product, then I, I help them in that um, transformation. And my background before that, I was a software engineering leader. I um, did 10 years at Heroku and Salesforce and Canonical before that. Uh, all in distributed environment. I've actually worked remotely for over 25 years now, and um, that's uh, that. I, I help uh, leaders build the type of culture that I have experienced, which are highly collaborative and highly innovative. Well, how did you? Um, are you a software engineer yourself? I started as a software engineer. Yes, um, in the um, <laughs> this is going to date me, but in the first wave of free software, before it was called open source, I saw the transition from free software to open source. That's really how I got started. I never, I always worked as a, in, in software, never studied CS, like computer science at, at school. Um, I was uh, like a <clears throat> working with um, free, uh, open source software, making contributions, Linux, um, at the Apache, I, I kind of contributed to um, the first uh, implementation of the um, the servlet. Uh, before this was like Java Enterprise, uh, there was an Apache, an Apache project to to implement the specification, um, help with that, and and then eventually that's how I landed at Canonical, which is the company behind uh, Ubuntu. I started there as a software engineer, and then a few after a few years. Um, I got uh, an invitation to become a thing lead. I really didn't know what I was getting myself into, um, but then switched to management and um, never looked back, really. You know? So after that, it was mainly engineering leadership, engineering management. I'm still programming, but mostly for side projects, things like that, um, but really uh, became fascinated by um, working with humans and how do you make a great team, uh, helping people grow, and all of these these questions. I, I actually, so in school, I, I, I have a sociology major, um, so I, I was studying other stuff than CS in, in university because I thought, okay, I, I'm kind of living this and um, this is going well, so I wanted to learn other things. And when I so made the switch to management, Sociology was kind of oh okay this 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 I can apply now um, uh, seeing teams and organizations as systems which is the uh, one of the lens that that sociology brought me. Do you think that someone needs to be a software engineer to be a team leader? Can they just have a, just a general background? That's a that's a trick. I mean, not a trick question, but it's a it's it's. I'd say that it helps a lot to have a background as a software engineer before becoming a, a software engineering manager. I actually, I mean, 
mainly for, for two, several reasons. The first of one that um, it helps engineers to trust you, you know, because you, you kind of have this background, um, you kind of know you've done the job that, that, that they had. Um, you're able to challenge them in ways, sometimes like that. So it's really builds respect and, and also understands the, the, the domain. Um, I mean, this is the same reason, so I think, I mean, you don't need to be have, have a software uh, background to be a coach to software leaders, but it helps a lot, you know, building the rapport, which is very important uh, when you're coaching someone, um, even though it's from the coaching perspective, that background is not necessarily uh, necessary um, or, and, and can sometimes like make you um, miss questions or things like that, which I, which, which if you don't have background, you can ask like naive questions, which are sometimes very productive. But in practice, um, yeah, it is it, very helpful. And then the expectation around software management usually is like a, there's a, often a, a lot of expectation around to understand what are the issues, um, uh, be able to to own and talk. So it's kind of it, it, I've been in several exec meetings where, and this is unfortunate, but the, 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 the directors or the engineers are there to tell how the software is going to be, be built and make decisions at, at high level without having all the context. Um, but because they usually most of these people have like an engineering background, it works, you know, um, kind of. Um, but yeah, so from I, I, in practice, it would be in the current in the current state of the industry, it would be very hard for someone who doesn't have any uh, engineering background to become uh, an effective technical leader. Um, I think in the higher, I mean, in big corporations, that's less true. You know, for executive position things like that, because then um, it, it, you don't need to, to to be a coder. You need to have an understanding. It's more important to have an understanding of the, what the business is, what are the problems, these high levels, but for managing a team of engineers, if you don't have an engineering background, you will be on shaky ground. So you can't really do that. You need to be an engineer first to, to become a coach. Uh, to become a manager, yes. To become a coach, no. You know, I know several coaches who don't have uh, an engineering background, and they're very effective work coaching. Um, because, I mean, it depends on what you're looking in your coach, you know. Um, but most of the time, the gaps are more like on the leadership front uh, than on the technical architecture front. If you are like a, usually if you're a director of engineering or VP of engineering, you've come through the ranks, you kind of know very well uh, the, the, the technology, and it's actually the other aspects of the role, especially VP of engineering, CTO, that are um, missing, you know, understanding, well, this is your job is not really about the technology first, but really about under, uh, applying the technology to solve a business problem. And this means communicating with your stakeholders, your CEOs. Um, <clears throat> so um, managing a team um, and working with humans, these are some of the skills that usually are, are, are not, I mean, that are not taught in computer science and, and, and that are what, what, what's required um, at that level. So, and, and this is true even at, 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 like at Salesforce and Iroku, we, um, we put a lot of emphasis, and this was a, a big problem for people, uh, engineers who wanted to grow, you know, their next pro pro promotion, or they wanted like to become a principal or principal engineer or, or an architect. And um, you can be very proficient technically, but if you're not able to rally people to your ideas, influence, work across, literally across the organizations, so all of what are, are so-called the soft skills, this is limiting your career progression, you know, because if, if you're, you might be the best coder and the best uh, designer of systems, if nobody wants to work with you or you're, you're kind of stuck alone with your ideas, you cannot have the impact that is expected of, of these roles. So, um, so yeah, that's why um, th th many people can go to a, a coach who doesn't have a background, and and it will work fine. But like I said, sometimes the the fact that you know that the person in front of you has a common background makes the relationship easier, and and 
and, and, and out full. Why did you become a coach? Um, I became a coach because I, I, I found this is what actually the part of the job that I liked the most when I was doing engineering, uh, when I was at the director level. Um, it was real. I, I worked with the, at the Roku. We had a lot of first time engineer, uh, man, engineering managers, so engineers who made the transition to engineering managers. And um, I found myself in a position where I, I offered mentorship um, for these people because I, I had done the, that, that transition myself and then mentored re, did my reports to, to, these, uh, to that transition at numerous occasions. And I have a, some some extra time, so kind of offered that internally at large, and then um, realized that okay, there's a difference between mentoring and coaching. Started studying the craft a bit, and really enjoyed it. Uh, 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 I mean, there's nothing to me more rewarding than seeing the people growing and having success, you know, and and, and making these shifts um, in, from. You know, only focusing on the technical to actually being able to work holistically in the organization. Um, yeah, that. So, um, and and at some point, I kind of knew this is what I wanted to do, and that's when I started to prepare to transition uh, full time in coaching, which is where I'm at today. Now. Very nice. Um, any other uh, info you want to provide? Um, I don't know. Nothing is coming up <laughs> to, to mind okay, at this well, moment. Um, I think one... you, you would be interesting to your uh, listeners. Yeah, so the second to last question I always ask is, what is your number one tip for the audience? Right, so um, I think the number one tip I have, and this is, goes from, like, if you're a staff engineer or a, a lead engineer or an engineering manager or any really any technical position and it probably carries over to you know pure engineering as well um, but the first the, the number one tip here is remember that whenever you're interacting with someone you're interacting with a, a human just like you you know um, this is something I find we forget we kind of we're interacting with the person as a mean to an end you know there's the person who made the decision or the person disagrees with us you know, because they have a different, they're sponsoring a different design or whatever it is. But before entering the discussion, just remembering that, you know, and, and from that frame, then the relationship changed. You know, we might disagree, but respect will be there. And, and more importantly, once you, you start to, to, to lean in and to, I mean, in a way, that's what's called empathy. You can understand how people are they're seeing what they're seeing are they're seeing what you're saying or things like that and then you you might be able to find uh, better you may, you'll be able to speak in a way that that relates to what they care about um, but that starts by really anchoring your 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 relationship and the fact that you're relating with another human being who have like a, a very complex life like 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 yours you know? Yeah, I can see that being a problem when you work in remotely and you never see anybody's face. Yes, yes. I mean, this is this this is something. I, I so like I said, I worked tw for twenty five years remotely, and COVID from that perspective has been interesting because I mean, on the good side, it kind of showed the world that hey, we can work remotely. On the bad side, it kind of gave a very skewed impression of what remote work was. It was very different working remotely before COVID than after COVID. Um, you know, I mean, it, you, you cannot work remotely without seeing people. When we were at the Roku and Canonical, we would travel, the team would meet, you know, right from two to four times a year. And it makes such, such a difference, you know. And then the rest, it's fine to go work each in our own home. And there's a lot of advantage to that. Um, and you know, would not do it otherwise. But the travel and the meeting people face to face is is crucial. I mean, there was no way you could start the job without at least within a month meeting your teams. But unfortunately, in COVID, that was the that has been the experience, and I think we're now seeing the backlash of that. So yeah, but you're you're totally spot on. Uh, empathy and developing this, keeping this in mind, is is crucial in a remote environment even more than in person. Although it's still very important in person too. 
All right. And uh, lastly, if people want to um, contact you for more information, what's the best way? Um, so they, they can find me on my website, thevpe.coach, or Francis Lacoste on LinkedIn. Love to connect with people on LinkedIn. All right, great. Well, Francis, thanks so much for your time, and we'll catch everyone next time on the podcast. Thank you, Scott.